Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for coming and thanks for the introduction, Larissa. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with John Malpete, who has always been one of my heroes um, and a really early inspiration for me and the work that I've done. So uh, we're just going to sort of show, and, and John's going to read some, some of his pieces, and then we're going to have a little discussion in between. And I think we want to also just open it up to, to you all. If, if you have a question, feel free to, to let us know what that is, and we'll try to work that in as we go along. And thanks for waiting. Sorry about the technical difficulties and delay here. So John's going to start off by reading an, an early piece, monologue. Uh, yeah, it, actually, it's, it's, um, it's, it's sort of the piece that got me to LA. Um, and it's something that uh, it was, yeah, I was living in New York. They were filling in the Hudson River, you know, with, uh, it was sort of an alchemical uh, idea. You take dirty river water and you mix in a lot of sand and then you create the world's most expensive piece of real estate. And um, so they were doing this in, in uh, but there were a few, you know, bad apples who slowed it down quite a bit with environmental impact studies for about 10 years. And during that time, this is like uh, what's now Battery Park City and the World Financial Center. Um, and uh, so for about 10 years, it was just a sand dune on the west side of New York. And uh, it was a great place to like, you know, go get some faux nature or something like that and see the sunset and stuff. And eventually, um, uh, Art on the Beach took it over. And they, during the summertime, they had commissions of different artists. Uh, and they would be usually like a sculptural manifestation. So there'd be like about nine or so uh, collaborations. And then there'd be a performative element which each one, so each week one of those would, you know, turn and 
open up like that. And uh, so in, 80, in 84, um, I, I did one with, with uh, Erica Rothenberg and uh, Laurie Hawkinson, who is an architect in New York. And um, we built a big, um, a big orange megaphone that was pointed across the street at the uh, then World Trade Centers. And uh, it was called the Freedom of Expression National Monument. And the idea is you would go up that ramp and you could uh, say whatever you had to say to the powers that be. And so as we conceptualized the thing, I knew I could use this in some sense in a performance. And the performance I decided to do was about, um, was, was about uh, at that point, you know, like, it was about homelessness, basically. And also about sort of one of the, uh, there was a big international banking uh, Ponzi scheme that was happening at that time as well. Um, and so uh, it was about those two things. And then it happened that um, while I had to write it, uh, which was the early part of the summer, I was in LA. Um, and it turned out, and so it was 84, it was right before the Olympics. It turned out there was a lot of uh, civic activity in Los Angeles, a lot of deep thought going on in the city council where there were suggestions like how can we make the city good for the, you know, the Olympics. And one was to like, well, let's open up the internment camps in, that were used for Japanese Americans during World War II and you know, send the homeless people there to sort of. <laughs> Um, and and uh, so I started going to government hearings, and I met and I met all these um, these grassroots activists who were working in tandem with uh, lawyers mounting class action suits uh, against the county of Los Angeles to enforce the constitution of the state of California, which means giving homeless people decent places to go to, uh, to live and stuff. Um, so as a result, I was able to make I was able to make a monologue that was like very accurate and uh, as accurate as, and as hallucinated as reality, you know? And so, um, so, I, so I was about, I had played two characters. One was uh, named Moto and the other was his friend, other, not identified otherwise. And, they, and sometimes I would use the, uh, the megaphone and then sometimes I'd run down, I had a little megaphone and like that. So I'm gonna read the opening of that and I have some, uh, on, on the DVD, if we're, we should be able to find uh, something that says Olympic update or something like that. And then we can get the, um, we can get the, uh, the Olympic, yeah, we can get the Olympic hymn and then that's just, after that it's just visuals and I'll sort of fill in the blanks over here. Which, which one? It's on the, the one that has a bunch of different things. I think it's called MIT disc. Olympic update, let's take a look. Oh yeah, it's that one. Art of, okay, Art of the Oh, see. Sorry. this piece was, uh, me and Moto, uh, we just came from Los Angeles and on behalf of the city of Los Angeles, hope, home of the 1984 Olympics and the homeless capital of America, Moto and I have been asked by the LAOOC, the Los Angeles Committee for the Organizing of Olympics to travel this land and to tell the, uh, travel this land during the Olympics and to tell the people of the, our land this Olympic update report. And they asked us to do this. They paid us uh, to do this. They gave us one-way bus tickets to travel America and to come here. They gave us one-way bus tickets, they paid for them, and this is called Greyhound Therapy. 
And we were in Los Angeles for the Olympics. And what the Olympics were like, the Olympics were just like the movie Blue Thunder. Because Blue Thunder was in Los Angeles. And just like in the movie Blue Thunder, there were super helicopters like Blue Thunder from the LAPD Skywatch watching down from the sky. And there, there were Olympic helicopters all over the city. Um, they were everywhere, the shiny ones and not the puffy helicopters that are round like balls, but the long, skinny ones like Blue Thunder that look like giant grasshoppers and they can see through walls. And they can point right at you and they know how cold or how hot you are. And they can find you and shoot you down just because you're warm thinking the wrong thoughts. And you thought there weren't any more of them because, because in Blue Thunder, Roy Snyder shot them down with the old fashioned bubble helicopter and got the tape to the TV station that showed how they were going to look through walls and go into your mind and read it even when you were sleeping. But now, now there are Olympic helicopters and they fly over the city and they sit on the sides of the skyscrapers like the 17 year locusts. Like when the 17 year locusts came and they covered all the trees in all of Ohio and they ate, 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 ate all the leaves off of all the trees in all of Ohio. And now, the Olympic helicopters, they sit on the sides of the buildings, reading thoughts and looking for terrorists. And then the LAPD, they come in, uh, down to the Skid Row Park at 6th and Gladys across the street from the Catholic Worker Hippie Kitchen and the Regal Hotel, and they make everyone lie down on the ground with their heads behind their hands. And they talk through the walkie-talkies to the Olympic helicopters, and the Olympic helicopters, oh, we have some cats with cameras down on the ground. And the Olympic helicopters read the minds of the people lying on the ground. And they signal to the LAPD. Yes, we do, we got some money. And the LAPD, they take them away. They take them away and they put them in jail so that we can have the Olympics. And if you're a terrorist, you can pretend that you're not by thinking cool thoughts all day long. But when you fall asleep, the terrorist thoughts will come back into your head. And the Olympic helicopters, no matter where you are, they will feel the heat and they will find you. And now that all the terrorists have been plucked up and carried off to jail by the Olympic helicopters, you can get a bed at the Wine Guard Center or at the Midnight Mission. And before the Olympics, you hardly ever could, and you have to sleep outside in a box, 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 all around the Midnight Mission on Main Street, box, 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 back in the alley, in your box, back. And it's okay. It's good. Because if you're sleeping there with everyone in boxes, you're not going to get into any trouble. Not like the old lady who slept all alone in the goofy car decorated with balls in the vacant lot, fifth and wall. She got cut up. That, that was great. Um, I, haven't, I hadn't heard that one before, so that was, that was really amazing. One of the things I was, I was thinking about was that in that role, you were sort of playing a homeless person. Yeah. And then you went on with LAPD to actually work with homeless people who then represented themselves. Right. But at that point, you'd also, you'd been in Los Angeles and you'd, had, had you started working with a legal aid organization? Well, when I wrote that, I, like I went out there in, uh, you know, in June of 84 and went to all these hearings and stuff like that and started working on this piece. And then I started, and I started volunteering. I went to government hearings and started volunteering with these uh, grassroots activists who were, who were um, yeah, mobilizing homeless people to go to the city and testify about the conditions of the hotels they were sent to and stuff like that. Um, 
But then I, then, I, then I did this in August in New York, and during July, I think I was in upstate New York writing it. So I was just sort of tiptoeing, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know I was moving to Los Angeles. I didn't know I was, uh, I didn't know much. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was in 84, and then in 85, you wound up moving to Los Angeles and starting Los Angeles Poverty Department. Yeah. And then in 86, did your first performance with them, with the group. Right. Yeah. What happened was I, because I it was, it was, um, I felt like I had fallen into a, a significant, you know, meaningful and, and situation in LA just because, because, uh, because of the connections I had made there when I was writing this piece or researching this piece, which were, you know, working with, like I said, there were these people, uh, the Catholic worker, which is a. Um, among its other, it's a it's a left wing Catholic organization, you know, lay 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 Catholic, you know, dissident Catholics, um, who started in the 30s in New York by Dorothy Day, and uh, in the, it's still there in the East Village, and they they provide hospitality to homeless people. They're also like the first people in the country to demonstrate against the bomb, for example, you know. So um, so they're a bunch of Catholic pacifist dissidents. And uh, it turned out by accident, they were the, when I went to these government hearings, they were the people who were doing this organizing. So even though I had sort of read Dorothy Day's books and lived four blocks away in the East Village and sort of you know, been really into it, I'd never actually gone down there. You know? And so suddenly, by accident, there, you know, there I was. Across the country on the other yeah, side. Exactly. That's when you actually. Yeah. So anyway, and because of what they had this later that at Christmas, the end of 84, they, had, uh, they organized a tent city across the street from City Hall in LA, where they housed like 300 homeless people. And again, it was all orchestrated with lawsuits, class action suits, which later in the decade, in the late 80s, it became illegal for nonprofit law organizations getting money from the government to sue, to mount class action suits, which effectively like, you know, defanged the, the few nonprofit lawyers that are out there. Because instead of, because, you know, effective lawsuits are about money, right? So if you can sue on behalf of 30,000 homeless people, that's a lot of bucks. If you sue on behalf of one homeless person about you know, not receiving their $200, then they can laugh that off and keep you busy doing meaningless work, you know, which is what was perfected later on in sort of the high Reagan period. But this was earlier in the Reagan period. You know? so. So what was the formation of Los Angeles Poverty Department? How did you actually get that together? Oh, yeah. Well, it was sort of an accident. You know, um, like I said, I was following my nose. But this free law center on Skid Row that I started working with that grew out a Catholic worker, uh, they were, you know, the director, Nancy Minnie, they, she was sort of into it. And at that time, another thing that's been disappeared, I mean, now the whole California Arts Council has been disappeared. They, well, it still exists, but they don't give out any money. They send out a, a, a newsletter, an email. Yeah. But uh, at that time, at that time, they had a they had a really vital program, which was artists and communities, and they gave out a lot of money. And they had a, I, I and did it, that myself yeah, later. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so with with Nancy Mitty, we wrote a grant to them, and then some um, Harriet Barlow up in Blue Mountain Center in upstate New York, where I had gone to actually write the thing. She uh, she also raised some money for me to go back out there for in the in the fall and work on, or no, I guess in the fall I went and worked on my own dime on the. Um, Tent city, but then in the spring they, we got raised some money so I could be there for three or four or five months, not knowing what would happen. And then this grant came in, and so then we were obliged to start these workshops. And by that time, they'd already offered me a job working as a homeless advocate, so I took I had taken that job. So I was helping people get uh, welfare benefits or housing or their belongings that had been uh, taken away from them by their and, hotel. And this is with no social work training, really. It was, or it, this is. No, and with no art training either, you know, so <laughs> it was good. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's how I got my legal training. But um, you had come out of doing performance work of your own in New York that didn't have a social component to it, and then tra transitioned into that through the social service work that you were doing in Los Angeles. Um, well, I'd done some stuff that was social, but I mean, yeah, I mean, 50% of the stuff I had done before, I say, was, you know, about social stuff, and 50% was about personal hallucinations. You know? And um, but um, anyway, that's yeah. That that was my credential that I was like inquiring artist wants to know. You know? Right. And um, 
so yeah, so then I was doing these welfare cases, and and so when I got the grant from the from California Arts Council, then it was like, yikes, we really got to do this thing, you know. So I gave uh, George Fry and Leroy Sunshine Mills a bunch of flyers. They were clients of mine, and Sunshine is I just I just talked to him yesterday. I mean we we stay in touch. He's still in. I saw him earlier in the week in L.A. Um, at an LAPD thing. Um, so anyway, they I said, you know, pass these flyers out, you know, and, and and a lot of people. It turned out a lot of people came, you know, and the most people came with like, um, you know, full. This is L.A. They came with screenplays, you know, that no one had ever read, or entire hip hop albums that no one had ever heard, you know. And so nobody really wanted to. Uh, no one wanted to take the time to listen to your entire novel when they were holding on to the greatest rap album that ever happened, you know. So it was sort of like uh, we had we had all. 12 or 15 of the greatest works uh, going on simultaneously, you know, is really the way it worked out. So, um, so then, so our first, the first thing we did indoors was called South of the Clouds, and it was a series of monologues based on the premise that, you know, I mean, most art I think is, is like pragmatic and nuts and boltsy, you know. But this was the, like, well, what happens if somebody doesn't show up? Well, then we just leave that part out, you know. And also because people didn't seem to be, be good at like, sharing the stage. We thought, well, it's monologues, you know? And um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so we did that. And sure enough, after the first weekend, somebody, somebody did disappear. And rather than drop out his monologue, we had someone else do it. And with an update on where we thought this guy was, which included San Francisco and eventually uh, uh, kidnapped by Martians, you know? And, um, and later on the show you saw in, in SFAI was about, we brought him up there two years later to explain what had happened to him during the interim, which, which he did in part of that show. Um, but So then you transitioned into pieces where everyone w was sort of working together. It wasn't just yeah. monologues. Yeah, the second show we really gave into the chaos, you know, and, we cre and, and created a show called, uh, which we're going to see a little bit of, yeah. called um, I'll tell a little bit about it though first. Called No Stone for Stud Schwartz, and it was really a, it was about um, yeah it was about giving into the chaos, and creating and um, so the veracity of the veracity of the show was sort of the the uh, the energy of the show. It was a totally uh, it was it was a goofy little story that that Jim Beam had come up with about a guy who was being who had organized the wrong union. He was supposed to have organized the uh, Teamsters, but he organized the AFL CIO, and as a result. Don't do that. He was being chased all around the, the world, ultimately, by the uh, Teamsters. And um, so it was a goofy little story, you know. And w I wrapped a uh, sunset monologue sort of thing around it. Um, so that at the beginning, uh, the narrator's lying dead on the stage. He gets up, tells the story, and at the end, you see him get killed. Um, and uh, the reason was, at that time, there, was, there had been uh, three or four uh, sort of point blank shootings, assassinations, you know, of, of homeless people who were sleeping, not in Skid Row, where there are thousands of people sleeping, but uh, like on the edge of Skid Row. And Jim Beam, the main character, was, was somebody in that, he was doing that, he was sleeping near Chinatown, near Union Station. And, uh, and he was like a very, uh, very smart, but very volatile schizophrenic guy who could create chaos, uh, e you know, easily. So he was a really vulnerable person in a really, uh, in a really uh, chaotic situation, which made it all more combustible. So, um, yeah. So he so he narrated the story. He he got up. He narrated the story. The catch was he would often get stuck on in particular things and would go into litanies of like sort of like this person begat that person or or the the lineups of the. He was very into the the Boston Celtics of the Cousy era actually, and he started talking about the, the lineup. Um, so I ended up playing his stunt double, and when he would. When he would uh, bog down, I would jump in and continue the narrative, which would piss him off sufficiently that he would jump back in and get me out of there. So we can see the beginning of that. And it's called No Stone for Stud Schwartz, if you can find it on that. Is that the No Stone Eulogy? No st oh, not, let's see, there are two things on there. Wait. Oh, no, it's, that's the one that's on the, uh, on the DVHS, yeah. So uh, th this is sort of similar to the performance that I saw in 1988 that was down yeah. at the San Francisco Art Institute. Yeah, that was a much more chaotic one where you were sort of jumping in and filling in on people's right. roles and do, doing lines. Yeah, this was the first one. And then we took it, we went to San Francisco for a month on a residency and made the second one, which is the one you saw. And then we also showed this one at the beginning of that residency.
Go there. Stop there. Three, Mr. Cecil. Stop there. So th those pieces weren't scripted in that they, they weren't written down. Right. But you but you rehearsed them. Yeah, we yeah we rehearsed them. Yeah. Okay. And that's a. Um, yeah, that also covered for like people not showing up and stuff right. like that because everyone would know all the roles at a certain point. Right. That, that was I mean, that was one of the things when I saw the performance that really struck me was that you were sort of walking in and interacting in a way that I, I think maybe my concept in going in to see that what this was going to be and the way it was introduced to me, the idea of, oh, this is some, some homeless people that are going to do a theater piece. And I was sort of picturing like, you know, doing a version of Shakespeare or something like that. And that it was going to be kind of um, soft in, the, in this way. And instead I walked in and it was just utter chaos and this completely you know, non-scripted seeming thing. But at the same time, that there, were like, there was lighting and there were, there were things that were happening that kept making you go back and forth like, this seems, this seems sort of professional and it <laughs> seems totally chaotic. And you were running in and out, always sort of doing people's lines or, or instigating something. Yeah. And that was what was so exciting to me, was seeing you actually uh, doing all of those things in a really physical way and, uh, and uh, in a not, um, in this kind of like, what I guess I thought of as kind of like a tough love approach, you know, like sort of making, holding everything together, pulling it together and making, drawing out these really amazing performances from everybody. I think in the, in, the, in that show, I mean, we played it. We played it on three sides. In that later on, the thing that was on the backdrop, we put on the floor as the boxing ring and played it, uh, uh, you know, on four with the audience on four sides. And the, the the cast would sit in the audience, and just like in a rehearsal, when somebody would be doing something, people would be screaming stuff out, you know, like bullshit or talking about something irrelevant or, or you know something else. So we kept that during the show, right? So people would be screaming things in from, from the audience and then just jumping out to do their scene. And then I was continuing to be his double so that, you know, to keep the thing moving. Or, yeah, as you said, if it was moving too well, then I'd, then I'd mess it, come in to mess it up and get this other layer of, of uh, you know, the real sort of unleash a layer of reality if it wasn't there and vice versa or something like that. And it was, like I said, the, the story, initially Jim's story was he was being chased by the, um, by the Teamsters for organizing the wrong union, but but myself and some other people in the show, you know, for me, what was important was the rapper, the the Sunset Boulevard rapper, and what, which was that vulnerable people were being uh, were in a chaotic environment and were be, even being assassinated. As a, you know, that, that real element was indicative of of the the danger that everybody living on the streets was in. Um, and so for me, it was important that it not end with him being assassinated by the mobsters. So we had two guys who were real into that, DJ and Julius. Um, but that it happened some other way. And because the whole thing was improvised, you never knew which night how it was going to play out, whether, you know, what, what narrative would be apparent, whether that he was killed by, the, by uh, some Skid Row assassin or by um, the, the Teamster guys. And in fact, one time, in one performance, I tackled the DJ to prevent him from doing the Teamster result, you know. So it was very live, you know, you didn't exactly know what was going to happen. And you were sort of asserting your own control to a certain extent. I mean, like, it's like... I just you're, 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 I was actively right, you were participating. participating. I mean, yeah. you, were, you were the director, but in, yeah. in, in this case, instead of just sort of like, you know, directing during the rehearsal, during the performance to direct the... the performance you would just like tackle someone. Yeah, I was using yeah. I was using being the, the authority of being the director to get right. away with causing a lot of trouble, you yeah. know. So I could be the bad guy, I, the bad kid in class and the teacher at the same right. time. I mean one of the I guess one of my, my questions that were coming out of that was just what is your, your what are your thoughts on working with non trained uh, artists, performers. I, mean, I, I realize that you two weren't aren't like classically trained or something, but you did go through uh, being in New York and being exposed to, to performance and doing performance yourself yeah, and then yeah. bringing that to people who, who yeah. hadn't had those experiences and working with them. Uh, and and to, you know, I think to a large extent there is this sort of uh, concern about people doing that, that and, and I get this a lot myself, that somehow as a, a trained artist in whatever way you're trained, working with untrained people, that there's this potential for sort of exploitation or um, that you're, you know, imposing your will on, on them or something. So I'm just, I, which I don't think, that was what was sort of all broken open for me when I, when I saw your performance. And I just wanted to hear your comments on that. 
dynamic? Um, well, I mean, in that case, I was sort of setting up a situation where everybody could inflict their will on everybody else. You know? Right. Uh, um, and I think, I mean, I think, I mean, a couple of things. One is I don't believe in talent. You know, I believe like in, that everybody is cool, you know, in their own way. And the other, th and the other thing is, um, I think, I think, you know, you've got to, like, I think you got, you know, I think you got to be willing to show yourself off in a in a less than perfect light, you know, and that, and that makes it, that makes things cool, you know. It's actually sort of similar to this uh, visual artist Thomas Hirschhorn and the work right. that he does. You're familiar with, with yeah. his work a little bit. Yeah, I know him a little bit. And uh, you know the idea of uh, the sort of like tyranny of quality, the idea that uh, something that's well acted means that there's actual meaning or content to it, when in fact maybe that's just a purely superficial thing, and that that something that seems like it's not quote unquote well acted. Could actually have a lot more meaning or you know energy within it. Yeah, I mean this was about this was definitely about energy. And what was funny about it is like there was even uh, um, there was a lot written about this piece because it sort of exploded what was what you were supposed to be getting out of you know you weren't getting most people understood that you weren't getting like the story of how someone hit the street you know it was more about the something more effervescent about everybody, you know, and about the environment. But there was one person who wrote a review about it, that this was the story of Jim Beam's, or of Stud Schwartz's life, you know, that this was autobiography. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, I forget what the thought was, but the thought, the thought was basically that it wasn't an autobiography, it was, you know, at all. It was, and on, it was, it was, uh, it had something to say on the energetic level. It really captured the energy of Skid Row, basically, and the, and the sort of uh, heightened, uh, you know, life and death of being really close together, humor as well, no irony, you know. The biggest thing about moving from New York to there is like, no irony, you know. And um, so that was what was interesting about. The, that show was it really captured the energy of the place, mm -hmm. not the story. Like I said, it was a B movie. You know, it wasn't. And um, yeah. And then Jim went on to live at my house for two years, actually, Stud Schwartz, and um, um, and I, during that time, I tried to get him a, a benefit that he'd been kicked. He, there's a SSI, a disability benefit, that he had been kicked off of during the during uh, when Reagan came in. He made everyone who was on SSI recertified to get their benefit. So of course the people who are like the most uh, disabled uh, failed to negotiate the recertification. And so uh, he- A similar thing has been going on lately too with the Bush administration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he ended up on the street. And, uh, and so uh, I got, one time, one night when it was raining, somebody else in LAPD said, take Jim home. So I did, but he stayed for two years. and. Um, <laughs> During that time, I tried to get him SSI, and actually, actually after one year, I did get, working with a lawyer, Louise Monaco, who specialized in these kind of cases, we got the money, you know, but he, then the next year, um, he wouldn't take it, and I spent a whole year trying to get him to take it. And um, it's, it's not on our flight path, but I think I mentioned it to you when we were talking. There's a, there's a little thing I did recently which sort of recounts that, and it, it, it's, it look, you know, I'd say I come off pretty, I mean, you could see how, I, like, I'm not, you know, uh, pretty unflattering in a certain way, you know? And, and I think that's what's important to like, uh, going back to your question before about, um, you know, I think you, how, do you, how, do you, how can you work with non-trained people, blah, 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 just, just by being, you know, Keep it obnoxious right. yourself, right. you know? So we, I mean, we could see that. There's a little bit off the flight path. I don't know what the time is like. We maybe, should, maybe we should move, move on, on to agent yeah. assets. Okay. So, so, I mean, the uh, LAPD continued with traveling, projects that were part of LA, LAPD Inspects America, and then also went on to Europe as well, yeah. bringing, bringing some of the, the people from Los Angeles and then picking up people along the way to do performances. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then eventually we arrive at uh, Agents and Assets, which you have a clip from, right? Yeah, so um, many years later. Yeah, we got, we did, after the show that Harold first saw, which was our first residency performance, people got really interested in the notion of having us come and work in their community in an extended way. So we did a whole series of performances called LAPD Inspects America, and then we went to Europe and beyond. 
where we would go and we would, depending on the setting, we would work with an arts organization and a social service organization if there was one. Sometimes we just, like in Philadelphia, we just recruited people out of the subway in the welfare office. And, uh, and so a lot of places we made first links between arts organizations and social service organizations and stuff. Um, and we, it, it, was like, it was like a Mission Impossible kind of project where you go, the ideal, I mean, the, the best case scenario was six weeks in a city where you do all this kind of rounding people up and all that, and you make a show, and you have to present it in front of everybody, and then, you know, so, and sometimes we did it in much shorter frames of reference. So we did a lot of that um, into the mid-90s. And then, um, then there were a lot of other people in LAPD who would come up through the ranks who did a, directed a lot of shows. Uh, in the mid-90s. Um, Kevin Williams, who you saw at the beginning of that, doing, doing the very beginning of it, he, um, he did some. And then there was another guy named David Hallanda who, who did a lot of shows. And, um, and then uh, somewhere around the time that, that, um, that uh, Clinton did the welfare reform, um, um, I, uh, it was right also when Kurosawa died, and I happened to see the, mo the movie Redbeard we with a friend of mine. We were watching a lot of uh, Kurosawa movies after he died, and that movie had such a had such a what I thought is such an accurate portrayal of, of poverty that um, I thought LAPD would really connect to this. So we did a plus well. So we did a performance um, where we showed the movie not on, not on a screen but on a TV, and then with having the cast alongside and like in a really small room like to these pillars with two rows of audience on the other side where we played the movie in Japanese with no subtitles and then we did the then we did the lines uh, in English and also abs sometimes abstracted movement or did group uh, choral kind of reactions and stuff like that um, so there was no there was no it wasn't improvised you know it was totally scripted there was no personal stories involved because a lot of um, we did get into a lot of personal stories during, in a lot of shows uh, that we had done. Um, and out of that, I think, then came Agents and Assets, which, um, which is uh, taken, um, is another scripted show. The found text is from uh, the, uh, the US Congress, uh, a, um, a hearing of the uh, House Intelligence Committee, which, uh, which has been in the news a lot now. Uh, and they, they're supposed, because they're supposed to have oversight of you know, the intelligence gathering agencies. At the time we did it, Porter Goss, who's now the head of the CIA, was the head of the committee. And, um, and there was, in 96, there were articles in the, New York, in the uh, San Jose Mercury News, going back to the 80s, to the Contra era, saying that the CIA had allowed uh, funding of the Contras in Nicaragua by, by looking the other way uh, at the importation of crack cocaine into South Central Los Angeles. So when this came out in 96, it created a big furor in South Central Los Angeles. Um, and it, it resulted in some hearings happening, including the one that we took the, the uh, script from. But what's interesting about the script is that, the, is that they're doing this inquiry, but uh, they have, um, it, they do such a bad job you know, that we said to do it very straight and with all, the, because it's so transparent, you can see the lies and the, and the, and the, the basically they're just doing it to cover up for the most part. And uh, so we did it um, totally straight and, uh, but with people who were in LAPD or in a women's drug program that we were working with at the time, uh, doing all the text. So it was like the people who were the on the ground experts of the effects of this, these policies were the witnesses, you know, really monitoring the, the, the government in a certain way. And uh, then afterwards, we always have uh, these uh, panels that address different issues that are brought up by the, by the performance. And the issues are everything from, you know, like uh, treatment versus incarceration, which is, there was a ballot initiative in, when we were uh, on the, in play when we first did the uh, when the, when we first did the show, and then but it also covers like uh, Afghanistan, for example, which is where all the where where the CIA has had uh, was you know was complicit with the the Northern Alliance and uh, and drug runners in fighting the, the the Soviets, and then they reinitiated that in order to fight the Taliban, and then it goes back to the Vietnam era when they were using. Um, you know, the Hmong villages and stuff as, 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 um, 
as uh, to work with uh, the CIA and covert operations and stuff. So we were able to like go from like inner city concerns and prison reform and all kinds of stuff to monitoring foreign policy. And we've done the show a bunch of times, usually in conjunction with an election where we thought there was going to be a ballot initiative. So that means we've gotten to look at you know, the 2000 election, the 2002 election, the, the run up to the war in Iraq, the 2004 election, um, et cetera. And we're actually making a book out of all these conversations, which include uh, policy advocates, drug war historians, journalists who were like Robert Perry, who, who were given, you know, who, who suffered severe consequences from reporting Iran-Contra in the first place, breaking a lot of the stories. Two people who were involved in arts and recovery, uh, recovery programs uh, to people who are, you know, in the programs. So anyway, here's a short excerpt of the show and one of the panels.
administration and their success in uh, Turkey, uh, it's something may have been more serious. And what was distinctive about the Nixon era was that they took this idea of extirpating or eliminating drugs domestically and they combined it with foreign policy using a military metaphor to create the drug war. And the thing about the drug war is in fact, uh, you know, applying diplomacy, intelligence, and military operations abroad to eliminating the supply the, and the smuggling of narcotics into the United States. And then the metaphor has, under subsequent administration, been elaborated and applied to domestic situations. So we've had a kind of a militarization of narcotics policy and a militarization of law enforcement over drugs in the country. Sonia, would you also comment on that? Yeah, um, the mainstream politicians that devise these programs are thinking about, you know, all those bad people that are the drugs, and they're thinking, you know, thinking the moral argument that everyone's bad, and in the same way, in Colombia and other countries, the people who grow the drugs, who um, who are, are also considered evil, and so when we, I think we have to be really careful about when we talk about the war on drugs because we found that if, uh, uh, before there was people, members of the Black Caucus that wanted to send aid to Colombia because they didn't want the drugs to come into their communities. That means that they weren't thinking about who were the victims of the drug war in Colombia. You know why are there campesinos addicted to growing coca, and um, we're we're supporting. Um, their, their, their death and their destruction and the destruction of the ecosystem in Colombia. In, in Colombia, there's two million displaced people and, and of the, inside the country that no longer have a place to live or work or, or, or make money or anything like that. And of those displaced people, about 70% are Afro-Colombian. People don't even realize that from a, from a quarter to a third of the population in Colombia are of African ancestry. And, and so there are a lot of racial elements to this drug war, not only in the United States, but also in Colombia. And so when we want to um, talk about making changes, I think we really need to, to broaden our minds and think beyond our own borders. So we have to try to look at like the recovery of the people that's been victimized by these drugs, right? Because those are the people that we really have to try to help, right? The, the, the innocent people, right? We have to realize that I think myself personally that that the government is is is, is the government is like the enemy of the people. Okay, so so that was showing both the recreation of the original uh, hearing and then a a, uh, a discussion that happened afterwards. Right, and that was with, in yeah. with with various people who had uh, their own expertise in those on those issues. Right, and then yeah. And that was that was in uh, 2000. That was in January of 2001, I guess. So we thought the next war was going to be in Colombia, but you know, we were wrong. Right. Anyway, so that, that that's a really uh, great lead into the uh, RFK and EKY piece because it's really using a similar structure, the one that you developed with agents and assets, uh -huh. of a recreation and the addition of extra sort of forums to to go deeper into whatever those issues are that are brought up by the recreation. And so then do you want to kind of quickly go into uh, what happened with RFK? Yeah, sure. So uh, I was invited down to, uh, Harold and I, we were both actually invited down to Apple Shop in uh, Eastern Kentucky. And um, we tried to get a couple different projects off the ground and then for various reasons they didn't work out. And then. Um, this project did get off the ground, and it was using, it was picking up on the strategy of this using a a hearing of um, and it turned out to be a hearing of Robert Kennedy going there in sixty eight to as a field hearing for the Senate investigating uh, this uh, hunger but they, he actually used it to give a platform to to people in the area to talk about environmental concerns uh, uh, jobs and and uh, you know, poverty, and also it happened right after the Tet Offensive, uh, so the so the war was also uh, involved as an issue, and uh, and I chose that because after spending a little bit of time there, it was clear that the people down there were not really that interested in having outside. They were sick of having outsiders come in and, and sussing out what was going on down there. So I figured if I picked something that existed down there, 
And the motto for the project being uh, to re recreate everything and create nothing. And um, that that would be, that would be uh, better, you know? Then I could say, well, I'm just ignorant, and, um, which I was. And uh, so, but what happened actually was that that, that event had a really uh, a big glow around it. It was really a treasured event in the in the area more than I knew when I decided to do that, because um, you know because obviously there was the star power of Kennedy and there were Kennedys and there was he was the first actual uh, you know national politician to go down there. Nixon did when Nixon came back after Watergate. He actually went to uh, that area as well as his first appearance, but that's different. Um, and so, so it had, so it, it, it had all those sort of like nostalgia, um, cultural heritage, all those kind of elements, as well as being something that looked at all these uh, serious issues then and now. And like the rest of the country, you know, the, the political dialogue, I mean, this is why it was interesting to me, the political dialogue then is not what it is now. And so it was a way of, um, it turned out to be a way of convening people around to talk about things that were still, still issues. Um, in a, and, but to expand the, the political context in which you could, of the conversation. Um, and then, like I say, you know, the, 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 war, the whole war thing showed up as well. Like I started doing the project in 2000 or something like that. And so, so it, but we did it right before the election in 04. So it, that all became uh, relevant also. So, um, it went, and what I, did, what I did do is I scrambled it, because it was, a, it was a recreation of, it went from initially being the idea of doing one hearing, the central hearing of this visit, to actually sort of tracing the whole route, which was a 200 mile route through the mountains in two days with stops in about 10 different places, little hamlets and people's houses and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and we actually did it in four days, and we put, we put a few vents at each end, but we also sort of shuffled the deck and put some right in the middle. So it wasn't just a recreation. It was like in one place there was a one-room schoolhouse that was still standing that we re, um, we did a cosmetic. That Kennedy had actually spoken in. Yeah, that he'd spoken in, that we had archival footage of him speaking in, that, that we knew the teacher, she was still alive. We had, from her we got all the pictures of the kids, which you can see out there. Some of the kids were there, the cook was there. Uh, Peter Edelman, two of Kennedy's aides were there. Peter Edelman, who organized the, the tour, and uh, Bill Arnone, who uh, played a part in the, he played somebody else in the show. People who were originally there in 68 yeah. came yeah. back for the recreation. Yeah, and Bill Greider, who writes for The Nation, uh, had, writ had written me an email. He had covered it as a young reporter for the Louisville paper. So he wrote me this description of what had happened in this one little room, and because we had the archival footage, we recognized it. So we were able to put this all together as sort of an installation going into a community conversation. So it kept flipping modalities. And we had uh, pancake breakfast every morning and an unlimited supply of, um, of clothing from, uh, that we got from East Letcher Ministries. Letcher is one of the counties down there. And we got it, for, the deal was we just didn't bring any of it back. That was the, that was the deal we got with them. And, um, and we had a couple, we had an Ed, we, had, we found Dexter the Democrat who uh, has a couple, he had like an Edsel and we had a couple, we had a couple old cars, you know. Period, yeah. period clothes yeah. and period vehicles yeah. and things like that right. to sort but, of. Yeah. But the idea was never to like collapse this moment into that moment. The idea was to have both moments present, which worked out really well budgetarily as well, you know. Um, and so I think the little bit we're gonna show is actually we made three DVDs about particular issues that we then distributed in the community for starting conversations after the project. And this one is about the war and because of, um, because of Harold's project, I thought this would be a cool one to, to show. Down there it says war. Let's play the movie, then we'll consider the questions later. Although the war in Vietnam was not on Kennedy's agenda, the people of Eastern Kentucky repeatedly asked him how he felt about it. His visit happened in 1968 at the height of the war, and monies appropriated for the war on poverty in 1963 were already being rechanneled to fund the war. It's about the Vietnam situation. Uh, Responsibility in this great nation. I'm John Taylor, I'm the Community Action Program at Dickinson 
concept, but the United States, the United States cannot conduct a war based upon the subordination of moral standards just for immediate success. There are more things to consider. Okay, before we go on, let, let's, let's see what we have here. Raise your hand. How many think that we should continue the Vietnam War the way we're conducting it now? Anyone? Now, I'm going to ask this very gingerly. Is there anyone else out there who thinks like the guy in the back? Just a few weeks ago during the Tet Offensive, there was a picture, and it was in papers throughout the world, and a suspected Viet Cong was taken to the chief of security of South Vietnam. And the picture showed the security chief taking a pistol and summarily executing that soldier. Clearly, that is in contravention of the Geneva Convention on the Rules of War. Now, our enemy proved Our enemy has done that hundreds of times. But the reason we wage a war against communists is not to become more like them, but to preserve the differences between us and the communists. That picture appeared on the front pages of newspapers throughout the world. And some of our oldest allies, some of our best allies, said more in sorrow than in anger, what has happened to America? What we are trying to do by stopping the domino effect is to create a great society throughout all of Asia. That is a pretension. We should give adequate we should give adequate assistance to people in Asia. But we cannot establish in Asia a great society if we are unwilling and unable to create one here in America. We speak extravagantly about a struggle for 250, 250 million Asians. How can we speak of such a struggle when a conflict in a country with 15 million people so strains our resources and divides our country? We were told Vietnam will settle all the difficulties in Asia, that it will somehow preserve the security of the United States. But that is a prayerful wish based upon mindless hope allowing us to justify the already great sacrifices we have already made. The truth is, Vietnam will not protect America from its, from its enemies. What it will do if we follow the same path for the next decade or beyond will involve the United States in a land war on the mainland of Asia. And our best and brightest military leaders have told us for many years now, that will only lead to national tragedy. But we have a more immediate interest to preserve the lives of our young fighting men and to conserve the assets of America. The best way to save our most precious state in Vietnam is to halt the expansion of the war.
if we are so willing to risk the lives of our soldiers at war. This nation must be told the truth, and the truth in all its reality. Not only because that's the right thing to do, because if you don't tell the truth, you will never be able to garner the necessary public unity that will follow us and what we will need to follow us through the shadow days that lie ahead. No war has ever required more bravery from its government and from its citizens. Bravery not just under fire, or bravery not just to make sacrifice, but the bravery to discard the comfort of illusion. What we have now is a situation where the people in the highest levels of government will not tell us the truth. They would rather not tell us the truth than risk the repercussions of... Okay, so uh, having been at the actual performance, so, and this was just before the 2004 election, it was, I think the, the feeling everyone was having was like, wow, th this is what Robert Kennedy was saying in 68. And wouldn't it be great if Kerry was saying this in 2004? And of course, he wasn't. And so it was a really just, it was sort of this uh, amazing and sort of disheartening combination of, of feelings that were sort of going on there. And then just to see the sort of parallels that were occurring between those two time periods. And, the, and then also knowing that Kennedy uh, would uh, declare that he was, he was running for president soon after this visit to Eastern Kentucky and then go on to win the, the California primary and, and be assassinated that same day. So that the, the hope that uh, Kennedy's direction that he was indicating that he would actually sort of pull out of Vietnam was, was sort of ended at that, at that point and, and a whole sort of direction that the, the US government and society would, would have gone in sort of was shattered. So, it was, a, it was a very poignant thing to, to um, have that recreated and, and re realize this, the significance of that, of that moment. Um, and that was, that was you know, an amazing thing to experience there. Uh, do you have any? Two uh, things. One, it was also right after you know, Abu Ghraib. So the business about the photograph he was referring to is this famous photograph of somebody being shot at point blank. And so, if, you know, so it resonated against that as well. And the other thing is where Alice Lloyd College um, at, was, was founded by a, by a Bostonian who went down there and carved a, you know, a settlement school out of the wilderness, Alice Lloyd. Um, since since sixty eight, it had sort of been uh, the board of directors had shifted quite a bit, and so that it had become a very uh, a very conservative uh, school, although it's still giving free tuition uh, to to uh, kids from Appalachia. Um, so so it was sort of a it was sort of a coup to actually be on the, that college campus saying those saying those words uh, to those students. And in fact, if we had gone on a little longer with this tape, there, it shows some of the rehearsal process where, where the, the kids immediately took it into a conversation about Iraq. You know, they just totally flipped out and then apologized to me after an hour of impassioned conversation for not doing what I thought, what they thought I wanted them to do. But, but in fact, they'd done it. But uh, they, their, their views of the war were like, a, you know, quite shocking to me, but it was an incredible conversation. Yeah. And so this, of course, too, was just one aspect of, of the recreation that hit on all of these other issues um, and, and that we're, we're not going to go into. But one of, the, one of the things I wanted to, to ask in relationship to this was that the, uh, oftentimes in, in, your, in the history of the work that we've been going over, you sort of cross the bounds between an, an art project, an art context, and social service kinds of of situations, and one of the things that happened as part of the tour was uh, bringing in to, into play this group of, of people who were involved with the Head Start program in Fleming Neon, and having them do a presentation about their experiences over the last, uh, that period of time since Kennedy had been there originally. Um, and, and I guess one of the things I'm wondering is sort of the, the hard impact that, that occurs in relationship to doing an art project that it seems like happens with your work is that you actually have real effects. Um, 
that go beyond the art world effects. Yeah, sometimes. Um, sometimes. Yeah. I mean, in that case, the uh, Head Start, you know, is a program, of, a preschool program for, for kids who, who are living in poverty, right? And it started uh, as part of the uh, War on Poverty, and it's actually the, the only, the most philosophically intact program out of that period because the funding, although the, the Bush administration has tried to change this, the funding goes directly from the federal government to the program. So like for example, last time they were trying to reauthorize, they wanted to reroute the money to the State Board of Education, which would have as, had the effect of still the same amount of money going to kids that age, but not to the poorest kids in, in the state. You know, it would have gone to other kids. So, um, so philosophically, it was important to highlight that program because we were trying to give a sense of what the spirit of that, of the war on poverty was about. Also, the, the two women, Elise uh, Jones and uh, Jill Hatch, who run it are like really extraordinary and just fun to be around. And, and the program, most of the staff, the teachers, the bus drivers, the cooks, are all women who, have, who started out as kids in the program. So it's been a real, um, you know, an amazing uh, way of, uh, way of uh, you know, realizing uh, development in people and in the region. And they, after, uh, after the project, um, Elise came to me and, and she liked the way me and my cohorts working in the community and they wanted to, us to work with the Head Start program around uh, changing the conversation around drug issues in the community. And there's like, there's a huge uh, prescription drug, mainly Oxycontin epidemic in that area. Um, which Oxycontin, you know, is a, pain, is a her heroin morphine based uh, painkiller, which was actually sort of target marketed to the, to the coal mining areas. Um, and uh, so, and the, converse, the conversation about it has basically been, you know, that it's a law, it's been in the, in the law enforcement context, like lock them up, you know. And uh, so they, so Elise wanted to change that conversation and, and make it more about a, you know, um, and put it more in a public health context. So over the last year, uh, we, we, me and my wife, Andrea Browers, and uh, Michael Hunt, who originally brought me down to Eastern Kentucky, have been working with uh, the staff of Head Start in the four county area. So like a, well, in one of the four counties that, that LKLP works with. So about 40 women and, um, and getting, uh, Mainly, we did a little bit of theater stuff with them last summer, and then we mainly did a lot of community organizing where, where they um, are leading biweekly conversations in each community, each of these three communities, uh, for the parents, for the, anybody in the community to come and talk about, um, about the drug problem. So that means that included in the conversation are people you know, who have kicked drugs, who are trying to kick drugs, the sheriff, um, and so it's created a conversation that you know really hasn't gone on there before, and it's it's really uh, it's 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 been very cool, um, and it's really yeah it's really had it's definitely having a, a huge impact in opening up um, different ways of looking at the at the problem, and because because you know Head Start themselves have to really uh, they've done a lot of advocacy just to keep their own program alive, you know they so they know how to. You know, they, they know how to go from local conversation to taking it to Frankfurt, which is the capital, and, you know, taking it to the congressman and, and really try. So it's all in process, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's really, you know, it's, I'm pretty excited about it right now. Yeah. The, the other question, and you kind of touched on it earlier, was the idea that you're, you're going in, in, some, in into these situations oftentimes without a lot of knowledge about what, what's going on, but by working on the project, you yourself become educated um, on the issues and histories through the sort of experiential process. And how, in a way, it seems like that's almost like a motivation, is for you to personally become educated, and then through that, you, you make it available in, to a, a larger, larger public as well. You mean my motivation is to get educated? Partly. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. And that that's that's a that's one at, at very at very least that's the that's a result is that you're becoming educated through your own projects that yeah. they're forcing you to to do research and not just in a, a traditional way but through experiential and uh, per, <coughs> person to person kinds of 
of ways where you're, you're learning about things that you might otherwise not ever be able to learn about yeah. other than going into these places directly and having those kinds of yeah. conversations and process. Well, I know, I know when, I, when I started LAPD, for example, I thought like, you know, because it was the Reagan years and that was like motivation for doing something, you know? And, um, you know, so I thought, well, I could go, you know, I could do something about, I mean, I wasn't thinking about, yeah, I could do something about um, the war in Central America, you know? But I felt like I wanted to do something that I would actually could know about firsthand, and I guess I could have gone to Central America, a lot of other people did. But I thought, you know, I wanted to yeah, know about something firsthand, not from reading the newspapers or reading books, you know, or something like that, which of course has become, you know, probably more important now that the news is more and more controlled than it was even then, you know? Um, so yeah, there was a notion of being on the front line and being able to re really find your own impressions. And in, in the Skid Row, like I said, I was able to do it because, because I was, uh, you know, I was I was I was taken in by and able to work with all these people who had been working there for a really long time and who had the trust of the neighborhood. And you know, so I learned from them. And then in, in Kentucky, I had the, um, I was given an insanely long. Uh, period to develop a project like nobody else uh, in their right mind would do that yeah. probably that's you know, an unusual opportunity I mean was, in other words it wasn't going okay here's like to come down here for two weeks and research your project it was like I did like a year of research you know being there going talking to people tracing the route going to the, going to the library here getting the transcripts going back there talking to people up hanging out at the post office all day and having the postmistress you know Actually, this is one of the big breakthroughs. You know, everybody who came in the post office said, "Where were you when Kennedy came? Do you remember?" And then they take me to their house, and they take me to somebody else. And they, you know, yeah. like that. So, but that's the kind of opportunity you really need, and it's really hard to get that kind of opportunity. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe we'll open up to a couple questions. Anybody out there have any questions about any of the stuff we've been talking about? Somebody must. Yeah. Just really basic. I might even miss something. For one thing, I want to say I think it's amazing to see this. It, I mean, the, the resonance between then and now is just unbelievable. But who are your actors? I don't know who your actors were in this group. And did they travel with you the route? It was the same Kennedy in all the places? Yeah, I thought about it. First of all, it was all people from uh, Eastern Kentucky, with two exceptions. One was. Um, one was the, Bill Arnone, who was one of Kennedy's aides, who heard about the project and came down and played a part. And, uh, and then another friend of mine from New York who played uh, Kennedy's other aide, actually. Um, but uh, it was all local actors, you know, local people, you know, local people, most of them acting for the first time. And uh, yeah, J Jack Faust, who, who was our Kennedy, and when we called him up, actually, he got in the project sort of late because the, the, the original person we had playing the role, um, is, he's a former coal miner now working as a nurse, and, and there were too much attrition in the nurses' ranks, and he couldn't get off the time. So we called Jack, who actually had done some community theater, uh, and one of our other cast members told him about it. And he said, well, you know, really, I could probably do a better Teddy Kennedy than a Bobby Kennedy. <laughs> And uh, I said, you know, it wasn't, it, it wasn't about, it wasn't about a lookalike contest, you know, it was about, it was about spirit, that's what it was about. So it was even better than he looked like Teddy Kennedy. You know? And, uh, but anyway, they were all local, they were all local people. And uh, Nell Fields, who worked on the project, um, is, a, is a, there were four people that worked all the time, uh, Andrea Browers, Michael Hunt, me. And, uh, and Nell, who's a local person who's been, been involved in the community forever. And so she, she and all of us worked really hard recruiting people, but she has like incredible uh, street credentials in, in the holler. And so uh, that helped us a lot in getting a cast together. And we thought about switching, <coughs> switching Kennedys at each location, but, and we could have, but we didn't. And was, I mean, you know, we had to rehearse. Uh, you know, we would drive like 100 miles to rehearse with some people up in Vortex and then over to Neon to do the other rehearsal and stuff like that. Another question? Yeah. I'm curious about, you mentioned um, Aftershock, and I'm curious about how, a little bit about that and how it worked with that. Well, Apple Shop is a, uh, also grew out of the world war on uh, poverty, actually. They were like, um, Carl Perkins, who traveled with, with Kennedy on this whole tour, was the 35-year congressman from, uh, from that area, and he, so he was pretty powerful in the Congress. You know, like, per, and he was really into technical education. Um, like Perkins grants that you hear about are, are named after him. And, um, and he, he uh, 
and some other people, they funded a certain number of video workshops, film and video workshops around the country, and they were all located in, in inner cities with the notion that people would, would learn these skills and get good jobs. But he got one for Eastern Kentucky, uh, which, which was at, at Apple Shop, and, um, and, or what became Apple Shop, you know? And, uh, but those guys decided, uh, as it evolved, they decided, well, they didn't want to leave, they didn't want to leave Eastern Kentucky and, uh, and, and like everyone else had to do to get a job. They wanted to uh, stay in the community and represent the community from, the, from their own point of view rather than being represented by camera crews coming in from elsewhere. And uh, so now it, it, there's still a filmmakers collective. They've made over 100 documentaries. There's a community radio station, which you can get on the web, WMMT. Uh, which is very eclectic community radio. So sometimes it's bluegrass, and sometimes it's uh, democracy now, and it's all kinds of stuff. And uh, and uh, they have uh, they do a lot of media training with youth. Um, our project has been a project of Apple Shop, um, and they have a traditional music project. They have a music school in the summertime, which would be definitely a nice way to spend a week in June. So. Anybody else? Okay, thanks a lot.